love it. Some drums. A little more, a little more. Standing. Welcome in to Says Who Sports Talk A Better Game, Episode 2, the second. So glad you can join us. Hope you're enjoying the day. And by the way, that Says Who Sports theme song was written by our friends in the Hook and Ladder Band. Big thanks to Eric and Michael. You can check out their info at sayswhosports.com. And the algorithms, please, however you dialed in the show, Apple, Spotify, Google, Says Who Sports, YouTube channel, subscribe, pound that like button. Maybe if you mash it an extra few seconds, it includes a bonus 550 followers. I don't know. But uh, thank you. Follow the show. Give us a like. Please spread the word about Says Who Sports. We're here for you. Um, all about the algorithms. If you have comments or questions, be sure to let us know. Email us at sayswhosports at yahoo.com, sayswhosports at yahoo.com. By the way, if you missed our first episode, featured the fascinating story, the origin of the phrase March Madness, and our conversation with Naismith Hall of Fame coach Bob Hurley Sr. It's there for you wherever you get your podcasts. Please watch. Think you'll enjoy hearing Coach Hurley's perspectives, including about uh, Son Dan, the Huskies at UConn. Are they marching toward a back to back national championship, second in a row? We'll see. Tough thing to do, but uh, Dan has him in the Sweet 16 again. Shooting for a second straight. We'll see. Says Who Sports is here for you. It's all about you. We're here to give you a fresh air escape from the stench of sports media, from their slanted and stale narratives packaged as so-called stories, and their sloppy scramble to the digital finish line in a desperate search for clicks, truth, or accuracy be damned. Who cares about accuracy, right? Just force feed you, the fan, their pablum, and they're convinced you'll choke it down and ask for more. Says who? Have another strong show to share with you today. Includes a conversation with a very special guest, a man who is right in the middle of the madness, the TV rules analyst for the tournament and the NFL on CBS a man with a unique gig for sure. He's everywhere. Certainly his voice is Mr. Gene Sterator is with us. Mr. Sterator has a lot to say and we think you'll enjoy it. Speaking of we, welcome in my frequent co-host at Says Who Sports, the man who beat out Ken Griffey Jr., for the Oscar Mayer Wiener Award, the big Wiener winner in the state of Ohio back in the day, Phil Dauphin. Phil, how you feeling, sport? Great to see you. What's on your mind? Well, I'm wondering if you can make the intro again. I just want to hear it one more time, John. I, I just like Absolutely. It. Thank you, <laughs> Phil. Everybody out there, love your patience. Let's do it again, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Um, you know, it's been a fabulous, fabulous week. And I'm just wondering how you're doing today, John. Well said, Phil. I'm doing well also. Special time of year. Last weekend, wall-to-wall -wall basketball, noon to midnight and beyond, and definitely beyond midnight. I couldn't do it. Some of those games, I couldn't hang in there. But uh, a glorious time and um, mentioned actually Phil email a moment ago. And we received an email at says who sports at yahoo.com from Carl in Kokomo. 
thankful to hear that Carl has us dialed up in Kokomo. But Phil Carl is a hardcore Purdue fan, big Boilermaker fan. And he wanted us to know that indeed Purdue did not lose to St. Peter's in the first round last season. They lost to Fairly Dickinson in that 116 disaster. St. Peter's shocked Kentucky uh, in a 15 2 upset two years ago. So we stand corrected. Thanks for caring and sharing, Carl, and for listening to Says Who Sports. Phil, I love that Carl loves his boilers. Love that he loves his boilers. And a shout out to West Lafayette, Indiana, and to Carl. And as John said, thank you for listening. Thank you for taking the time to email us and correct us. We appreciate it. We do indeed. Accuracy matters. It's our duty to get that right, whatever it takes. And we will do that for you. You have our word. We will do it for you. Again, you want to share thoughts, questions, or like Carl and Kokomo, corrections. We welcome those at says who sports at yahoo.com. On the email thing, Phil, I have received for a year, uh, sometimes two, three times a day, emails from the Baltimore Orioles about everything, anything going on with the club you could imagine. No invite yet to hang out with Adley Rutschman, but it's coming. I feel confident about that. Adley, Phil. In fact, I received two of them, Phil, today. One telling me to get the hell in gear and get my tickets for this weekend's games at Camden, I guess, right? And the other from the new Orioles owner, David uh, Ruben, Rubenstein. 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 Thanks, Phil. It was a pump up video saying fans have to make the difference. Fans got to do the job. It's crucial. Phil, I respect it, but I think players have to do it on the field. You got to win. Any club, anywhere, you got to win. That's it. And so the, you know, making the play deep in the hole to nail the guy at first base or the the chopping a guy down at home from the outfield, the throw. I mean, players got to do it, right, Phil? They got to win. Yeah, the hype videos only go so far. As you said, they, they don't allow the center fielder to track one down in the gap lay out and take away a double from somebody. That's that's not a Boom. hype video. That's the players. Boom. Yeah. And and frankly, Phil, horrible what happened in Baltimore. The bridge collapse. Um best to everybody in all in all ways with that. Um maybe the Orioles can start hot and rally the troops, Phil, rally the city to some level, bring some good vibes right out of the gate. John, what a gift it would be to the city of Baltimore for this talented and loaded Orioles team to bring it all home this year, right? Given what has happened, it, it would just be a gift to the city of Baltimore. Absolutely it would. Have you been to Camden Yards, Phil? I have not. I, I love where it is situated. I love every time I see it, both from the outside and the inside, but I have not been there for a game. Did you and, and Kim, did you go to a game last year? Last season in May, we did. Kim, my wife, and I were out there, and uh, we made our first visit to Camden Yards. Um Saw a game there, the Inner Harbor, as you said, the setting is just perfect. Uh, Boog's Barbecue, Phil, the pit oh. beef, oh, the barbecue smoke, wafting, wafting. You know, I heard recently that it's wafting. I always said wafting, always have heard I wafting. I think it's wafting, I, Phil. I actually like wafting. I like that. 
Wafting. I like wafting. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll go with wafting, especially as it applies to the pit beef smoke thick in the air from Ooh. Boog's Ooh. Barbecue. They get they have the beautiful, I think it's 1950, uh, amazing pickup truck out there, Phil, just gleaming the pit beef Ooh. smoke. But but guess what? The T-shirts at Boog's, awful. Awful, oh, Phil. Say it isn't so, John. Bad merchandise? Bad merch. That does not settle well with you or me, that's for sure. It it felt, Phil, I, want, I wanted nothing more than to bring one home. And you know, thinking about you to bring one back for you. A couple of XLs, you know, Boog's Barbecue, wearing it proudly for the legend Boog Powell. Um they felt like they were made from those old uh, Brillo pads. Just nasty, hard. I mean, Ugh. hell, wasn't going to happen. Wasn't going to do it. John, how can that be done to Boogs? How, how can you do it? you you, you got to have the quality merchandise, quality tees, maybe some nice hats. That's a shame. Yeah, it, I, I agree. It hurt. It hurt. Phil, how hard is it to make a quality, softer T-shirt for your customers? It's not. I get it. You know, budget considerations, all the above. You just don't want to spend or have those extra few bucks. But I say, and you say, try blend. Hello, try blend. Soft, 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 soft. No Brillo pads. Uh, couldn't do it, Phil. But... Camden Yards, amazing setting, amazing setting, uh, beautiful weather day. They played, Phil, the Orioles did, the team formerly known as the Cleveland Indians, the tribe, the tribe. I always respected that name, Phil, and loved the Chief Wahoo logo classic, and I understand considerations, Native American considerations, absolutely understand and respect, but it just seemed like a super quick trigger pull by Indians ownership. I know there was heavy pressure, right? They changed the name, the logo, the whole thing in 21, right? It's already been, I think this is the third season upcoming of the the wow. Guardians thing, but it feels so wrong to call them that, Phil. What say you? John, is it hard to say Guardians and not chuckle? I mean, just Guardians? <laughs> of all, of all the different names, of all the different names, Guardians splashed across a jersey. Um, uh, they're forever going to be the Indians in my book and probably a lot of people's books. Generations Amen. that took took their sons, took their grandchildren to see the Cleveland Indians, Chief Wahoo. Bring it back. Amen. Bob Feller, the, the greats in Cleveland, the Indians, the tribe, and now that proud franchise represented by statues on a bridge, Phil. It's it's reference, I believe, to the guardians of Traffic. That's not right. I feel for <laughs> tribe fans. I mean, I feel the pain. Phil, can you imagine Jim Tomey, big Jim, turning on a fastball and taking it way downtown for the guardians of traffic? John, how about this? How about Len Barker throwing his perfect game, right? Or no hitter perfect game. I, I should know that but wearing a Cleveland Guardians jersey, right? It's, it's, it's not right. It's No, it's not right. It's, it's not funny. We feel the pain. Um, rather laugh than cry. I mean, that's the, yeah. that's the Indians and the tribe forever, um, not Guardians of Traffic. Phil, you still have, you know, the, again, they changed the name in 21, and again, we stand to be corrected. If we're wrong, let us know. Says who sports at yahoo.com. 
but I believe the name was changed in that heavy duty, heavy pressure from a societal sense scene of 2021. But you know who didn't waver? Their knees didn't buckle in Kansas City and Atlanta. You still have the Chiefs and Braves, right? They didn't cave. They didn't cave. Ownership said, hang on, hang on a second. And they did not cave. Absolutely. I, I remember, Phil, that summer there was a columnist for the Kansas City Star, I remember, wrote a piece shouting at the Chiefs, hey, Chiefs, it's time. Do what's right. Get rid of the Chiefs name. You know, trying to be so correct and cool in those moments. And as you said, ownership took a breath, said, have a nice day. They did not trigger react and seemingly, right, the heat faded, thankfully. John, what, what would have been the name had Kansas City Chiefs ownership caved? What, what are we looking oh, at? What, what do you think? Um, Phil, great question. Un, unbelievable. So, so what would we have the back to back Super Bowl champions? What Chiefs gone? So be back to back Super Bowl champions, the the Kansas City Fountains, the 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 <laughs> Kansas City burnt ends, Phil? The Kansas City burnt ends? No. <laughs> hey. No. Sign me up for some quality merchandise with Kansas City burnt ends. <laughs> Ooh, now we're talking. Yeah, I'll, I'll wear that one proudly. I'll represent the burnt ends of Kansas City. But no, it's the Chiefs, the back-to-back -back Chiefs, by the way. If they can uh, pull the triple next fall, I'm on that wagon hard come September. Go Chiefs, win, win a third in a row. But uh well, if the Bengals can't get it together, but that's a different conversation. No excuses. Get it done. But the burn ends, yeah. Back-to-back -back burn ends, I, I would take that. But it's the Chiefs, and it should, uh, should still be that way. Anyway, Phil, speaking of, and you gave it, what is the situation with the chop in terms of, and, and I've wondered, you and I have talked about that, um, where did the chop originate? Chiefs fans, obviously, I mean, they, they are owning it strong. I mean, geez, full yep. throat, nonstop. They're still doing the chop. The Braves, you and I know those, those power Braves teams that started in 91, early 90s after our beloved yeah. Red Legs brought it home wire to wire and swept the so-called unbeatable, mighty Oakland A's. Eh. Red legs bring it home in a sweep. Eric Davis, Jose Riho, Paulie O'Neill, Phil, but I digress. Ooh. Reds of 90, but the Braves, right, starting then or early 90s, they had the chop, right? They Did they have it before the Chiefs? What am I missing? Am I missing? So we had talked about this and we were wondering, and I, I wanted to try and find information on this. So to make sure everything What'd you is find? accurate. Well, to make sure everything's accurate with this, the Braves organist, Carolyn King, was credited with originating the Tomahawk song, not the chop, in 1991. Mm. So the organist, Carolyn King, with Atlanta Braves, she created the Tomahawk song, started playing it. Uh, the, the first Tomahawk chop apparently is credited to Florida State Seminoles. Braves adopted mm -hmm. it with the oh. song, and the rest is history. And those teams wow. were loaded, too. Ooh, yeah. Fascinating, Phil. Thank you so much for the homework. We try, again, try to bring value 
to you, the audience. We appreciate you. We try to bring you value in various ways. And that's some value there. I wasn't aware of that. Thanks for sharing, Phil. The origin of the chop. You're you did you say Carol King? Are you talking like the, the prolific? It's too late, baby. Now it's too late. You're not talking about, are you sure not Carol King? Can't that's be. a good ask. That's a good ask. It was Carolyn King, the organist. Carolyn. Carolyn, Carolyn. King. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Yep. Um, so she went with it on the organ. Ooh. Yep. Yep. That was Carolyn King. Wow. Shout out to Carolyn King. Great home. Amen. Thank you, Carolyn King. Um, Nice stuff, Phil. And as you said, unbelievable. Well, we could say unbelievable Braves teams and unbelievable that dominant Bobby Bowden era with the Knowles. Dion, of course. Peter Warwick on back, all, all of those crushers, right? Yeah. Oh. And John, you had a chance to talk with him, Bobby Bowden. You had a chance to talk oh, with him goodness. for an extended period of time. Goodness gracious, it was an ultimate honor. So thankful to have witnessed those teams and what he did for college football, Phil. Though I must say, if I lump the Knowles and the Braves in and, and the, the hallowed chop, we'll set that aside as you make me uh, kind of consider those clubs, those teams. E- on one hand, you can't say underachiever because what a run they had each year. You know, Bobby, what did Bobby have, Phil, uh, with the Knowles? I, I believe... I believe this is right. Certainly I'm in the ballpark like 14 straight years. And this was all way pre-BCS, pre-college football playoff. But those Bobby teams, Phil, I believe I heard 14 straight seasons they finished in the AP top five. I believe it was 14. I know it was at least a dozen. That's just insanity. 14 or ballpark. I mean, or ballpark. Exactly. Unbelievable. 12 to 14 Phil and brought home the biggest hardware. Not enough. I'm sorry. Not enough. I know Jimbo got one, but the teams that Bobby had, and I know the ball has to bounce the right way. Uh, key injury here or there. I get it. I respect it. We know that's sports. I would have preferred they brought home at least one more somewhere in there. One more than they did. Did they dismantle Michael Vick's Vatech team? Was that uh, the Seminoles? They, they did. Absolutely. Dismantle. And was that in the Superdome? Seems that was in the Superdome. I think it was in the Superdome. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They Michael Vick, what a what a player, what a story. Electrifying that year. Took college football, took defenses by storm. And then came the national championship and as you said, the loaded Knowles. And it was not pretty for uh the Vatek faithful. No. And on a side note, Phil, again, just random note, trying to bring value for our audience. I'm old enough, maybe that's not a good thing, but old enough nonetheless to recall, there's a little trivia just between you and me. Do you recall the name, the mascot, if you will, of Vatek uh, in the, the old days? Not the Hokies. Long before the Hokies, Vatek was named what? Mm. Any guess? Guardsman. Ooh, good guess. You have you have guardians. You have traffic guardians <laughs> on your mind. I get it. I get it. Jim Tony. No. <laughs> 
he coached Vatek a couple seasons. Uh, oh, it was uh, the ready for this? The Gobblers, the oh. Virginia Tech Gobblers. Fill a, a would it be a fighting turkey? Certainly a turkey. And forgive me if it's if it were not a fighting turkey, it should have been. But it was the Virginia Tech Gobblers, right? Who knew? I don't. It always stuck with me, Phil. John, why not? And that's that's a great it's a great poll. Why not combine <laughs> gobblers with guardians and just have the Cleveland Gobblers guardians? <laughs> why not put it all over the jersey? <laughs> yeah, the hey Phil, you're on to something. The alternate jersey weekend, and it's like everybody's used to the guardians, and it's it's the gobblers this weekend. Get your free T-shirt. Your Brillo uh, pad, across you know. BP jerseys. <laughs> <laughs> Guardians, uh, no, we're the Gobblers this week. I love it. Good thinking. <laughs> Good thinking, Phil. Hey, um, you know, we talked with Coach Hurley, Hall of Fame Coach Bob Hurley Sr. last episode again, and we were talking about disdain, disgust, certainly on my end, disgust, vent it, lament it wherever possible, the brutal, senseless jacking of threes, the three-point shot, right? The questionable jacking of three-point shots in brutal spots at crucial points when a bucket would do, Phil. And, and we're not talking, this is common sense, people. Don't at us, don't at me. We know we're talking common sense with regard to disgust for the three-point shot as it applies to, you know, just come on, move the ball, drive it hard to the bucket, et cetera. Not, let's put it this way, Phil, not Jack Golke from the Oakland Grizzlies threes. Woo! We're not talking about on fire, house on fire threes. Jack Golke, that'll live forever, right? We're talking about mindless, questionable, not smart basketball jacking of threes, right? Discuss the hell out of me. What do you want me to yes. say? But you pointed out, you said early on, you said, John, we're going to see it early Thursday when the tournament tipped. Uh, all the way through, and certainly examples of we did, and especially for me, painful to see one example, I believe it was Texas, Tennessee, forgive me, I believe that's right, and the Longhorn player, they're bringing the ball up the court, end of game, 20 seconds left, again, like you said, in the ballpark, 20, 21 seconds bring the ball up court, past half court, top of the key, still maybe 12, 13, 14 seconds, instead of driving the ball hard to the bucket, hello, drive it hard, get the bucket, probably, maybe get a foul. In any case, if you get the bucket, you're able to foul, you can extend the game, make them win it at the free throw line. And guy swings around, takes a pass, jacks it, off balance from deep in the corner, clank, terrible shot, bad move, Longhorns go down again. No surprise there, right, Phil? No surprise on the Longhorns going down on uh, the hardwood uh, on the big stages. I mean, yeah, they they got to the second round, right? But uh, it ended like that, just a, a an awful three-point shot and – Clark Kellogg and Charles, Sir Charles, were as well expressing disdain for it in the studio after the game, Phil. Just junk. Junk. John, Coach Hurley mentioned something about it after you brought it up. And he, he was just basically beside himself, right? Had some great comments when we talked to him about that exact thing. Boom, boom, boom. Off balance three. Uh, throw it. Yeah, as you said, junk. Yeah, you're right. He did. Um, 
he had things to say about it. And again, if you're tuning in for this episode and you didn't happen to catch the first one with Hall of Fame coach Bob Hurley Sr., you can find that just like you found this. It'll be there for you. Some amazing things, powerful things that uh, Coach Hurley had to say. So as mentioned, we had a conversation this week, Phil and I did, with one of Pittsburgh's finest, the one and only Gene Sterator. You may know him or recognize his voice as the go-to TV rules analyst on NCAA tournament games. His voice is everywhere during the games, right, Phil? Um, everywhere. And actually, Gene described it to us, right, as not – he sees it not as a rules analyst, but more as an officials analyst, Um you may know him from his 15 years as an official in the NFL, including as the referee in Super Bowl 52, Eagles, Patriots. Many say Gene is the NFL's best official ever. But Phil Wright, Gene would be quick to defer to the greats that he learned from. He told us Jerry Mark Bright. I found that so powerful, Phil. He told us yeah. Jerry Mark Bright, Jim Tunney, those guys that, as Gene put it, ah, oh, Phil gave me a chill. Those are the Tom Brady's, the Michael Jordans of NFL officials, according to Gene. Think about that, Phil. Yeah, it, it was. It was such an outstanding conversation with them. I can't wait for people to hear it. Absolutely. And again, you'll hear him at some point tonight when the 16 tip off and through the weekend, the play-by-play -play talent will at some point defer to Gene's crunch time expertise on those replay reviews as we begin the second weekend of tournament action and head toward Phil, by the time we get to Phoenix, there'll be four. <laughs> Glenn Campbell would love that, right? Rest in peace, Glenn Campbell. Rest in peace. Wow. Mm -hmm. So good what we have on tap. And in talking with Gene and listening to him, um, among the incredible stories he tells and the experience experiences he's had as an official at the highest levels, NFL and NCAA, what stands out through it is his humility, his sincerity, his gratitude. Phil, he's been in this thing for the right reasons, and it shows. Right, Phil? It does, and, and that's a great word, humility. Uh, it it completely shines through with him, and uh, he was so gracious with his time in talking with us, John. Absolutely, he was kind enough to take time out of his hectic schedule uh, to visit <laughs> And we think you will enjoy what he has to say. Phil, says who? Says Gene, Gene. Sterator. That's who. <laughs> <laughs> we think you'll enjoy it. Here is that conversation with Mr. Gene Sterator. We are honored to be joined at Says Who Sports right now by a member of the unofficial first family of officiating, I say. A man who spent 15 years as an official in the NFL, who was the referee in Super Bowl 52. A man who spent more than two decades as an NCAA basketball official, including March Madness games. And a man who may have the best hair in the business. 
currently the rules analyst for the NFL on CBS and for CBS and partners for the NCAA tournament. You heard his voice on almost every game last week, one way or another, Mr. Gene Sterator. Gene, welcome into Says Who Sports. I feel like we needed a touch of Michael Buffer to bring that home right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John and Phil. Uh, the hair statement, as I age, I've started to embrace much more. It used to make me a little queasy, but uh, you know, as Father Time continues, I'm going to celebrate the fact that I do have uh, some of the hair still hanging in there. So I appreciate that intro. You're looking good, man. I'm I'm a little embarrassed. I'm thinning out up here. So don't Gene's showing us up already, Phil. Gene, share with us what you had a hectic week last week. What was last week like? for you in terms of travel and your setup as the rules analyst uh, for the tournament. You started with the first four in Dayton last Tuesday, right? And that's a long week. Please take us through it. Yeah, you know, when, when the NCAA basketball portion of, uh, of my work with CBS begins, um, we do have uh, a march into the madness rather quickly. You know, um, we get a little preview with, uh, with the first four and what I must say, even from my years uh, of experience in officiating in the Atlantic 10, one of the best arenas, really, uh, Dayton Arena is one of the best arenas for college basketball. And I really think the NCAA hit a home run in choosing that location to kind of launch the tournament every year. Uh, the fan base there is just so unbelievable and they love the game so much. Uh, and as you said, you know, once you get through kind of those first two evenings, um, you're off and running in a pretty heavy fashion with 16 games on a Thursday, followed by 16 games on a Saturday. And then, as we know, down to eight and eight as it relates to what I do. So doing the quick math, I think we're kind of into 52 games over a five-day window. Um, so to say that the buffet is open for me <laughs> as it relates to basketball and uh, – and you can be a glutton in, in the smorgasbord life that you could live. Um, mm. I definitely feel that for the first five days of the NCAA tournament. Fantastic. Well said. Thanks for sharing, Gene. Describe your setup for the tournament. Are you at the studio? Are you in your own studio? Yeah, we, we do have what, the, what we have called the ref studio. Some nights, depending on... You know how many hours we've been in. It may turn into the ref lounge when we're checking in with locations. But, uh, but yeah, we have a um, we have a studio that the uh, that the, the CBS uh, you know uh, people have put together up in New York. Um, I've got a collection of just wonderful people that are working EDS uh, machinery to give me my replays and manipulate screens for me, along with audio and a producer naturally in the studio that sits directly with me. Uh, and kind of uh, takes care of all of those other things that I'm definitely not capable of doing. And, and then what we also do, which I think is really interesting, and, and it may answer some of the, the curiosity to those that uh, find some interest in what I do, is, you know, how does he jump from game to game so quickly, right? And my goodness, he's, he's everywhere, uh, and, and it seems within, within an instant. Uh, well, on the technological side, you know, the jump from a location, the communication with each truck that's at each location, then the communication with those producers, directors, and all those individuals on location interfacing with mine. Uh, we also have what we call loggers in my studio. And, and most times I really try to keep it with existing college basketball officials that might be at the Division II level or working some Division I basketball, but their season has ended. So every game is really monitored by an official or someone that really understands officiating in the game. So when we're dealing with four games at one time for a 10 hour you know, stretch, um, naturally you can't watch all four games at one time and you can't listen to every broadcast at the same time. But when a play comes up, a situation comes up, one of those loggers who are looking at their own screens and have the ability to rewind some of that, that screen that they're they're kind of connected to, uh, they will alert me. And then the beauty of watching three or four or five uh, big screens change and morph into that location uh, kind of in an instant. Uh, and then you're kind of under the gun a little bit in the sense of, uh, you know, 
there's not that much time if you really think about it once the officials in the basketball space blow their whistle decide that they're going to go review something now you've got to get to that location you're naturally trying to remember which talent is broadcasting that game uh and the teams the rosters the names of the players as you are starting to get feeds of replays that are being downloaded so that you can scrub that play as quickly as possible from more than one angle uh, and then let your producer know to alert the location that Gene is hot and you can open him up. And then uh, one of our great talented announcers or play by plays, you know, bring you in. And then hopefully within this little window of time, once you get on air, you can basically summarize what you believe has occurred while those officials that are on the court are dissecting the same thing and coming to their results. So it, it it's a rather relaxed, chill place for a lot of times. And we're sitting like everybody thinks you do sit like, hey, I could do this job. He's doing the same thing I'm doing in my living room, which is true to a sense up until the moment that uh, we have a pending replay or or a dissection. And then then the whole place turns into uh, a very quick and well-oiled machine where everyone at that level naturally is so good at what they do that, you know, you're trying to uh, you're trying to get an awful lot of work done in seconds, truthfully. Great description. Well-oiled machine indeed. How, how would you describe it, Gene? Your role, it, let's say in a sentence, how do you see, how do you sum up what you do? How do you describe your role? You know, I, I like to think of it more as an officiating analyst, I think, than a rules analyst. Uh, and I and I say that because honestly, John, like there are times and I hope that this is the case as this position has started to uh, kind of morph and, you know, and, and grow into something more than, hey, who touched it last or, you know, what are they going to set the clock to in basketball or, OK, we know that the three elements of a catch are this right and walk us through that in a football world. You know, my hope is that as we do navigate those spaces and um, and hopefully, truly, uh, and this is a little more than a sentence, but I think it, it, it requires uh, as much, you know, my personal goal in this is, yes, to take the casual viewer uh, who knows a, enough about the game to really like it, but maybe doesn't understand some of the nuance of the game and then they get lost in those pieces of the game to to bring that you know into more light and and kind of in as basic of a way and concise of a way make sense of something that appears to be complicated uh but then at the same time it's the three and four hundred level fan that does get it that does know what you're doing and then also every once in a while kind of give them a peek behind uh you know this is a different level of a dissection and this is why so in the rule space and trying to define this, I try to attempt to do that. But then at the same time, I really hope that over the course of this, although many people push back because officials maybe quote unquote aren't liked by anybody, you know, at the given time, depending on who you're cheering for, there has to be an appreciation for the third team in every sporting event that we all participate in in an organized fashion. Uh, and the appreciation can't just be that, hey, we have to have refs or umpires or whatever so we can play. It has to be that what they are doing on the field courts and parks is not easy because it isn't easy. And I think the more that all of us that love the games, as much as officials truly love the games, um, the more we appreciate all of the human condition that's involved from every facet of those games, I think the, the greater appreciation for the totality of it takes place as well. Um, and, I, and, I, and I hope that that's conveyed sometimes. I know every once in a while the fan base will get upset if I say, look, in real time, this is really hard to do, right? And you get a lot of pushback sometimes when you say that, like, uh, yeah, we know it's hard, da, da, da. No, it's really hard. And these are decisions that people are making in fractions of a second that we now get the luxury, and I even do, quite frankly, get the luxury to rewind that and watch this fraction of a second broken down and frame by frame dissection. 
which kind of simplifies it, I think, sometimes to us at home. But you never should lose sight of the fact that these decisions, which are 90 plus percent of the time correct, are being done by human beings that are in the right spot, reacting the right way, digesting a play in real time and getting it right at such a high percentage that we almost take it for granted. And I think we jump a lot in that smaller percentage when the human condition comes in. Um, so I think when, when I'm doing this, it's not just to do all of that. It's to try to let the country know and the viewers know um, by put, putting yourself in the right position, understanding the nuance of the game, uh, digesting all of these things that have so many tentacles in such a short window and really making it look easy at times should not be ignored or taken for granted. So officiating analysis, I think, might be a little better way of defining the position. That's a great description. Thanks for the education on that. Not rules, but officiating. And you you went to that third team, that team that you guys are. Absolutely. You have the, the you know A and B teams out there, and you guys are absolutely... Uh, a team as well. Thank you for that. On that note, Gene, I think two words that apply to your career certainly um, are intense scrutiny and in many ways, outrageous scrutiny. And again, not exclusive to you, but to those of you that have been in and continue to be in that position. I want to share here the smallest sampling of some of this, of course, this is some of the social media madness. So you, you would say low hanging fruit, but but a sampling of to Gene specifically in these cases. But Gene knows that from uh, unfortunately, and this is kind <coughs> of scary, from the youth level on up in our country, this is uh, this is intense stuff. But here we go, Gene, just a, just a sampling. Just watch the play, Gene. This isn't rocket science. Gene miss calls all the time as a ref, and that trend continues now that he's an analyst. Hey, Gene, we all know the league is pulling your strings. Gene, <laughs> Gene is why most people can't stand referees. How much... Did Team X pay you, Gene? Get your eyes checked. Gene, you are so awful. Gene Sterator is a plant. He's there to agree with the refs, no matter how terrible their calls are. Gene, you suck. You're a clown, pal. How much does Vegas pay you? Gene, are you drunk most of the time? I can't believe anybody pays this effing guy. He's never correct. Uh, two more, Gene. Gene, you're a hack, and I'm thankful you're no longer on the field. You're so worthless on TV. And the classic closer, Gene, you need to seek counseling. You're nothing, nothing but a shill and a hack. And now in fairness, we also know there are many reasonable fans, believe it or not, who say Gene is damn good. We would be two of those at what he does, and they love you. So that said, and that's just the surface stuff, as Gene knows, he's, he's heard it all. Most of those were from our mom, Gene. I don't know those are just... <laughs> Hey, She's Bill, tough, Gene. She is a tough customer. I, was going with this. I think the first <laughs> 20 examples, I think those were all my family. You know? <laughs> the two or three nice ones, I think those are probably from the regular viewer, right? I mean, that 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 is the world we live in. <laughs> oh, so so good. But so talk about the mindset, the the mental toughness it takes it it took you to rise level after level you've heard it all uh in an arena full of people a stadium of eighty thousand, uh, an official in a youth league game um basketball or football how has your mindset developed to reach a level where you can if not block it out you can execute at the highest level and let that stuff roll 
How do you do it? Hmm. Um, all kidding aside, uh, in, in one word, um, and that's empathy, right? Um, you're in a you're in an environment where a sporting event is taking place, and those that are either at the youth league level of a fifth grade youth basketball game, the fans that are there for the most part are tied into the players, coaches, and participants of that game in a very intimate way. So their reactions to uh, things that may not go the way of the loved one that they are witnessing and cheering for, there's a venting that takes place. Although the situation or the definition of someone that is weighing in or the size of the arena or the stadiums change, I always try to be empathetic to the things that were being said and try to square them with why they were being said and never personalize it so that it became a personal attack, even though many times the wording was very personal. Um, that allowed me to accept behaviors that I wouldn't accept in my home directed at me, uh, but understand those behaviors and never personalize it from the individual that was spewing it. Um, and that's the fan interaction of that. And quite honestly, I had a tendency to always try to make those situations lighter than they were as opposed to escalating them by a stare back at a fan or a threat to throw the fan out of the game or something of that nature. If I felt like those that ridicule had risen to the level that the other people that were in that vicinity could no longer enjoy that contest because it just became so consistently abrasive that the experience that other spectators wanted to have was being hindered as opposed to just a spewing reaction of emotion and then a settling. At that point, I may get a uh, game ops or game authority involved because I wanted the whole fan base in that proximity to be able to enjoy the contest. But I can also tell you guys that there were many nights and, you know, I, I think when I look back on some of them, assembly hall was a place that I, I can remember personal engagements that reflect this kind of uh, memory because there's people sitting right on the court, right? So they they are close. We are perspiring right next to them and they're fans and they want to dislike you when the call went against the home team there. And I get it. That's part of this game. It's quite frankly, I think part of it's what I really enjoyed about it. But every once in a while in the midst of that, I, I learned to have a rhythm where I didn't have to look or see who it was, but I knew who it was, right? And you would try to time it so you would catch them in mid-sentence so they really couldn't stop to hide what they were saying and you could catch them. And then when you would kind of turn and catch them, the human reaction would happen from them where they would pause for a moment because they weren't expecting you to do it. And then rather than then attack, I would always look and try to take that bead of sweat off of my forehead and flick it to the court and then just kind of look at them person to person mm. and be really honest and say, this is really hard, you know, or something like that. And then to watch 90% of those people recoil. And we had then a personal moment like, I know I'm really close here. This is really hard they are really big and they are really moving. And then you kind of have smile and then you disengaged. Um, that was how I approached a lot of it. Right. I mean, so as I've retired and as I aged in my profession with officiating and watching the next generation of officials come up, mm -hmm. um, this was a very large part of that mentorship. And it was taking the next generation sharing those experiences in real time on the court or on the field, walking them through different ways to engage in those, those kind of that verbal judo, uh, right? And, uh, and also making it gratifying enough that it was okay. It wasn't affecting what you were doing, 
You know what I mean? And I think, um, I think that's, that's part of the beauty of this. Now, as you continue to read all those social things, and then I think one of them was actually, you know, maybe do I need to see a psychologist or something like that? Quite frankly, I think that's a very fair statement because in order to do this and not personalize it with the vitriol that could come out at some points in these contests um, was something I probably should talk to a psychologist about, you know, because I, I embraced that. I knew it was part of it. And um, you hope that it was minimal, but you knew it was inevitable. Um, and I think there was a navigation of some of that or continuing to persevere through it or to make that very unhappy fan every once in a while kind of become human again and appreciate you was very, very satisfying to me. You know, I've always looked to if they had a significant other next to them as they were spewing, you kind of would be standing on the court and you would look at the person next to them and go like, you're you're with her or you're you're with him. You know, and and then inevitably the others that would be in that close proximity would get a chuckle out of it because you broke it down for a second. You know what I mean? And and then you moved on. So that that was a part of it. Um, but to an official that's new and even officials as they they grow and the crowds become bigger and sometimes the attacks become maybe more severe, although unfortunately in our business, some of these things and these sad cases are happening at a very low level. Um, that's a very challenging part about this avocation or profession that we all as lovers of the game, regardless of what we're there for, coaching, playing, spectating, cheering, uh, we have to remember that collectively, that it's a very important part of the game. Uh, it's okay to boo the refs, um, but we, we don't want to take it to a place where, you know, I just don't want to do that for the $35 on the weekend. I'm not going to work the youth games. I'm just not going to do it because quite honestly, if that happens, uh, the games that we love and all these beautiful memories that all of us that love sports have had in our long lives, it's at risk. And that's important. Um, and I think at times we need, we all need to understand that. So as much as you try to make light of it, there's a serious note in this at some point. Right. And I think, all of us, as I said, are accountable to how this continues to evolve as we move forward. So well said, Phil. Unbelievable, yeah. right? I mean, you could take that apart on so many levels. Um, should be required reading, required hearing. Just not, not, not as it applies to sports and officiating, but as it applies to life. So many life Absolutely. lessons in there, Phil. Absolutely. And, <clears throat> excuse me, so Gene, a couple of years ago, I coached my son in AAU basketball. Mm -hmm. My, I, It was my first year of coaching that, and I was shocked at some of the comments that were directed towards me and the refs, right? It was, it, the parents could be absolutely brutal, uh, and that was AAU. Yes. So, yep. Yeah. And, you know, if you think about it, Phil, you know, when I'm in an arena of 25,000 people in a major college atmosphere, there's security everywhere, right? There's lines of protection. You've been to AAU uh, convention centers where there are 20 games happening side by side and the fans are sitting on your bench and there really isn't enough security. No. Uh, and when those unfortunate situations can occur in that space or that setting, um, it's a, it's a very uneasy feeling. And that's how our officials decide whether they want to ref. So when you think about it, if we have those, those experiences as you're just learning the game, just like the kids are and the coaches at times are, what's the chances of wanting to do that next weekend, right? Not high. Right. Mm -hmm. Not high. Great. So well said. Great, great to point out, Phil. Gene, your father as well. I mean, again, I go back to uh, what, what I dub first family of officiating. But your, your, your father was a well-known official in Western Pennsylvania. He had a huge impact on a lot of people, a lot of young officials who wanted to be like him. And I assume that that includes you. In fact, Am I correct, Gene? He became one of the first officials in the old 
Atlantic 10, the original Atlantic 10. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, it was called the Eastern 8, uh, wow. John. And then when the Eastern 8 became the Atlantic 10 and the Big East was formed, my father was part of that group of officials uh, right in the early, early, early days of the Big East and, and, and all the, you know, all of what we know of the, the legendary Big East formation. So, yes, and he was a two-sport official. He was an amazing football player at Pitt, was a great running back in the early 50s. Uh, was one of those stories that, you know, he was work, you know, was, was working the JV game and the varsity official got hurt, you know, and just started his officiating career, was bit by that bug after his playing days and realized this isn't easy and there's some competitive edge that you have within yourself to be able to be good at this. And I think he was bitten by that bug, which most officials are bitten by when they get onto the playing surface and off of the, uh, out of the stands. Uh, but then, as you said, it was the launch pad for not my, just myself, my older brother, Tony, who was a 20 year NFL back mm -hmm. judge. Uh, my younger brother, Michael, who worked years of small college basketball. Uh, my cousin, Frank, who's worked major college women's basketball and now has just finished his first year as an NFL field judge. Um, so there's just been, you know, officiating kind of in the house that somebody was a ref for Halloween every year. I had six brothers and sisters. <laughs> so, you know, somebody was going to have to be a ref because we weren't getting seven different Halloween outfits every year. So that ref thing kept going and going. And uh, and I passed it along actually to mine. My youngest child of three is, uh, is a young man that now lives in San Diego and is refereeing some major college and mostly small college basketball as well. So it's it's definitely in the DNA, uh, you know, and we do have uh, we do have my late father to thank for that. Well said, Gene. And, and in terms of your your dad, what what words of wisdom, insight, et cetera, did he give you back in your earliest days along the path that still stick with you? I mean, in, in through your long career in professional football, long career on the hardwood for the NCAA, all the factors, many of, we've just touched on. Yeah. What what do you hearken to that he told you? You know, back then, there was no video. There weren't 80 games on a week. There was one game on once a week, maybe, and maybe one other night would get in a game. You know what I mean? So there wasn't this gigantic inventory of games every night to watch and digest. Uh, they're also from the ref, it, the intimate part of officiating when you're actually refereeing. There were no training tapes being put out every week on the Internet. They weren't grading film with high def cameras and watching your plays from five angles. Uh, so he didn't have to live through that micromanagement or that high level of scrutiny that we all know the current world has presented to us when we watch games even, let alone get graded by the games, right? But the one thing that I know my father loved tremendously, and I think he was one of the best to ever do it, my father loved to manage the game. My father loved to manage the coaches, the players, the atmosphere, and take all of that pressure and, and all of that just impulsive, quick reaction, decisionary making, the emotional shift, the intensity, the biasness of, the, of reaction, and, and all of that and the diffusing of things that could escalate and blow very quickly. And quite honestly, the majority of that generation was so good at that. The old time officials could manage games. They knew how to handle those personalities. That's changed a little as this has evolved. There's not as much engagement sometimes with that. But I think more than anything, that's what I think my, my father loved the most about officiating. You know what I mean? And I think that's watching. Look, my father was a supervisor of small college football and basketball for 35 years in an association called the Tri-State Association which covered small college in, in a little bit in Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. I have been doing that since he has left. So mm -hmm. I've been involved in that association really since I was a child, but active in it from my early 20s for the last 40 plus years. And watching my father 
help officials take that that jump from scholastic sports to college sports and what that truly meant in that space and then to mold young officials and give them a nugget here or there or 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 do those things i really think of all the things my father did and accomplished which were tremendous on on his own from his achievements I think probably one of the things, if not the thing that he most liked about being an officiating was that. And great officials to become full circle, in my opinion, that's the part that closes the circle. It's the fraternity that enjoys giving back to the next fraternity and sharing those experiences and, you know, thoughts and and, and the mentorship of that. It's the drives in the car for three Mm. hours of game with an older veteran that's talking about the game. They're not asking you about the block charge play. They're asking you what the coach said to you at the 12 minute mark. What'd he say? What'd you say back kid? I said this, Ooh, maybe next time say this. And you would think, really? I, I should say that. And they'd be like, you know, just try it, you know, and then you do it and it worked and you wanted to get in the car again. And, uh, that's what this is all about at the end of the day. And, and even as you just really said to John early was it wasn't just officiating all of a sudden you were in the car for three hours up, three hours back. There was a two hour game in between. We're not going to talk about this game or the next game for six hours. Now you were tying in something that happened in the game to something that happened in your personal life. You're developing a bond and a friendship that transcends the game you're learning things about yourself. You're learning things about how to be fair, how to take a breath. Uh, and then all of a sudden these, these ends connect and it's not just officiating, it's defining me as a person. And then I think when that starts to happen, something extremely special happens in the officiating world. Because uh, as you guys know, when you work high school, small college, it's not the plane ride every day. It's uh, it's the drive. It's getting home at two in the morning because you threw it up at seven thirty, and you were four hours away from home, and the game ended at nine thirty, and you're on a lonely road in this part of the country, and it's snowy, and it's February, and you're driving by yourself, and there's a lot of windshield time. There's a lot of time to reflect on uh, many things in life, right? And um, and I think that is the part of it that is at times the most rewarding aspect of all of this. And then understanding that if you have family at home, there are others that are sacrificing your absence uh, while you are following this passion, which isn't feeding the family by any means. Uh, And then it's the appreciation of what they're doing to allow you to continue on that journey with something that you really love to do. So uh, really multi-layered and it's a very deep and rewarding experience. If anything of any of the listeners can get out of this that might be thinking, you know, maybe I should try that. They need to understand that that's the beginning of it. And then when this really takes off and and it can happen, there are there are some very deep rewards here in in multiple ways. Incredible, Phil. You know, what pops to my mind is how could we do this to go back in a time bubble? Let's say 20 years ago, you and I get to ride along with Gene as he's, oh. he does a game in Lawrence, Kansas in a hallowed hall <coughs> and, and, and it's 10 degrees outside and you and I get to watch him do his thing. And then we ride in the car. Can you imagine Phil? My goodness. I mean, it would be absolutely beautiful. It would be fantastic to be able to do that, John. To, to watch him at his craft, climb in a car, and forget about a four-hour drive, Gene. Let's do six hours. <laughs> six hours. We'll buy the burgers. Yeah, Six it. hours. Yes. Good. Good. Combo <laughs> meals. Yes. And, and, and Phil, as Gene pointed out, you and I might go right to, well, what about that call? You know, baseline, Gene, block charge, whatever. And Gene's going, no, you missed the whole thing. Here's what Bob Knight said. Or here's what right. Roy said at the 832 mark, right? Magic. Right. Wow. Now, th- do you think he tripped him, Gene? No, you're you're missing this. <laughs> you're missing I'm it, trying dummies. to share with you. <laughs> if you don't get it together, get out of the car. It's cold. I don't care. You, I'm, all I'm asking is you be smart. You can't handle, yeah. 
Un- unbelievable. Gene, uh, just a few more. And we're, we're so thankful. You've been so gracious yes. with your time at a hectic time of year for you. Um, brothers and, and your older brother, you mentioned Tony was also an, uh, a, a professional football official. You guys worked games together. Did you not? How cool is that? Share with me anything you care with us. Um, story or two from game or games you guys work together, whatever pops to mind. Did you have disagreements? I mean, was there ever a, I'll show him kind of thing? Cause I mean, that, that Italian pride, right? The, 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 your, the your family, right? I mean, yes. you can't dislike family every once in a while. Who can you dislike? Uh, my older brother, Tony, who was almost nearly four years older than me, the, the oldest of seven children, uh, four girls and three boys, uh, my business partner in a business we started uh, as two really young guys uh, that we still run today, uh, an amazing basketball official uh, that decided he wasn't going to continue to officiate basketball when the, when the NFL opportunity was presented to him or really the major college football opportunity was presented to Tony, uh, was my basketball partner. We would work together just he and I in a business that we started on our own, no other employees, argue at the office, go home, get your ref bag, somebody picked somebody up, drive to the high school gym, maybe arguing on the way to the gym. He didn't like the travel. The basketball part for Tony was if I could just get him to the gym, Mm. the drive home was amazing. The drive to was not a good thing. (laughs) He just didn't want to be in the car. But we would go out some nights back then. There was only two officials in, in high school and great basketball in Western Pennsylvania, like really good sports here. And we're, we're fortunate, Ohio, Pennsylvania, good scholastic sports. Um, we would have some nights, the gym would just be completely packed. And, and we would look at each other and say, okay, every block charge can't be called the same way tonight. Like if you're going to go charge this way and then we're going to just go like this and that, or we would switch our mechanics up and have a little, I guess, dance off for lack of a better word, right? Like you can't make the same call the same way twice tonight. And we would kind of want to want to one up each other, not in a showman way, but and work on mechanics in real time and in joke around one of the greatest stories Elizabeth Forward High School, jam-packed gym, uh, big rivalry game. Uh, I make a call, and uh, the crowd starts to chant the student section behind the baseline. As in the old days when you made the foul call, you went and stood next to the free throw shooter, and then the official bounced you the ball. You handed it to the shooter. You back away. So I make a block charge call that the crowd just doesn't like the home crowd, and I'm standing there waiting for my brother to bounce the ball to me. And the student section starts and it goes to the hair, Travolta, Travolta, they're chanting, <laughs> right? So instead of my brother giving me the ball so I didn't have to be subjected to this for an extended period of time, he kind of keeps it on his hip and says, come on, Danny Terrio, give him a couple, you know, Saturday Night Fever <laughs> dance steps. And inevitably he makes a call three or four minutes later and the roles are reversed and the crowd and Tony was a little thinner than me and the crowd is chanting Don Knotts Don Knotts and <laughs> I'm holding the ball going come on Barney Fife shoot a couple of rubber bullets at the student section you know so oh. we went from that to Tony when Tony moved to major college he, he got in the Ivy Patriot League in football a few years before I did my brother walked me through my progression mm. uh, he was a couple years ahead it seemed when Tony launched to major college football, his track took him to the Big Ten. And we separated at that point. My track took me to the Big East at that point when Miami and Virginia Tech with Michael Vick and the resurgence of Miami became a thing. That's where I went. Uh, within two years, Tony was in the NFL. Uh, wow. Not because he's my brother, uh, just because, you know, quite humbly, I my brother was the best back judge that I ever worked with. And I worked and there, that's nothing demeaning to some great, great back judges. Dino sure. Paganel was like family to me and still active in that, in that high altitude space. His brother, Perry, 
uh, Scott Helberson, who's from Iowa, Big Ten official, but at any rate, so we did disconnect as we climbed that space. And then Tony got in the NFL two years before me. And as you said, John, it was my third year, Mike Pereira, who hired me, uh, then called. And, and, and it's one of those few handful of calls you get that you do reflect back on. And one was, congratulations, the NFL wants to hire you. And the next one in the NFL space for me was, uh, we want you to be a white hat in the NFL. You know, and that was after five years or so of mentorship from Jerry Markbright in Red Cash. Mm, Jerry Markbright. Wow. The legends of the game. Our Michael Jordans, our goats, our Bradys, our Jordans is Markbright, Tunney, Cashin, right? Um, and when Mike called, he said, you know, we would like to make you a referee. And it's 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 it takes your breath away to hear that. And he said, and not only that, I'd like to ask you, would you have any issue if we made your brother your back judge? who really is down the middle of the field and downfield never happened before in the history of the NFL where two brothers were on the same crew. And uh, it, it is the most memorable call I ever had in moment. Those three years that we got to share an NFL field from being 10 and seven in the backyard, pretending one was Lenny Dawson and the other was Joe Namath. And now you're looking downfield 40 yards away and your big brother and you are standing on Lambeau field mm. and, and it is your backyard. It is your big brother. You, I had a sense of security. I was so lucky that way to feel like literally you had your big brother on the field to be overseeing you as you clicked microphones on in this stage. So those moments, um, to this day, it's extremely difficult to put it all into words, but those that have loved ones that they admire so much and, and, and the fortunate, you know, to have that, it, it just was, it was surreal. Now, my mother was so panicked because when, when I, that I hung up, I phoned her immediately, right? And, oh, honey, you're going to make you a White House. Oh, my goodness. And I said, Mom, it gets better. I said, you know, he, Tony's going to be the back judge, complete silence. I think Tony just came off his first Super Bowl, And I was like, mom, are you there? And oh, I'm here, honey. I, I said, everything. Okay. Yeah. But you know, your brother's never been overturned. She said on a ruling on the field, what happens if you have to overturn your brother in replay, you know, and was, right there in the first 60 seconds, yeah. you talk about a parent. <laughs> understanding where you were heading. And I said, mom, what makes you think after 30 plus years of, you know, being bullied and, and roughed up by my big brother my whole life? Why would you ever think that I would want to like punch back and overturn something that he ruled on the field? He had never been over, you know, overturned in his career up until that point. And as fate would have it. Yeah. I got him twice in my first year as a referee you know, <laughs> on the field. And uh, those are those moments that you just, you, you, you know, you cherish them, you know, and, uh, but, but it was amazing. It, it, it really was. And, uh, and to this day, I mean, it, it, it never stops that, that never goes away. You, we got to be kids on the pretend field in the backyard and we continued to be kids on the literal field. You're on hallowed ground. It's Lambeau field. That's your brother, right? I mean, wow. What else can you say? I, I just, I'm, I speak a lot, as you guys have already seen. That was fantastic. That gets a little deeper and quieter because it's, it's just, it's really surreal and was, and we were so blessed to have the opportunity. We really were. That, that is, that is profound, Gene, and we can feel it. Thank you so much for taking us there. Would this have been, I assume, during the Brett Favre era? It was, and that's that was Brett. Actually, it was the Packers at the Dolphins was the first overturn, uh, where driver catches a fifty-yard bomb, and and Tony says incomplete. I go into replay, and the way the process works in replay is the referee would go into the hood at that time, and the back judge is kind of the liaison between television commercial break time and you coming out of TV and going to make an announcement. So inevitably when I would come out of the hood, if I was done before we were back from TV, we would stand kind of together on the sideline and, and my ventriloquist voice as much as possible without my lips moving. He would always kind of 
hands on hips and I'd be standing there and he'd say, we're out, we're, we're back in 10. Uh, what do you got? You know, and I would kind of let him know without moving my lips before I went on the field. And with this specific catch, I remember I didn't stop next to him after the replay review. I kind of continued to wander onto the field, which he knew he couldn't get over there to me because we were going to be on air and he couldn't be with it. And as I went by him, it was kind of like in disbelief. Oh, hey, what what are you doing with this? You know, and it was his play. And I just kept walking and I turned around and looked at him and he gave me the true big brother look. Uh, and he went, we're back. Not happy. You know, and I clicked the mic on after review. Uh, the original ruling of incomplete. It is a catch touchdown. Far runs down the field, picks driver up, carries him off on his shoulder. Tony is staring at me like, you got to be kidding me, right? And after the extra point, he's under the goalpost. I give the extra point. We punch back out for TV, and I hear him yelling like from under the goalpost. You know, you need to come here. We have, we're going to finish this discussion, you know, and I – I remember pointing at my hat like, nah, today I have the white hat. If you want to talk, you're going to come here. You know, so we role played it. I think Favre heard it a little bit from a distance. He wanted to know if we were going to fight. I said, yeah, I think we might, but it'll be really quick. You know, we had some fun with that. And, uh, uh, but there were, there, there were some great times, but so, so many times um, as a young official. And I think he really helped me with what I think helped me kind of get the gig I have now. Uh, he would look at me if, if he thought that I could add something to a play that wasn't penalty related, right? He'd tap his waist, like, get on the mic, say it wasn't pass interference because the ball was tipped or some other nugget that was good for the game but didn't stage it. Also, I found in reflection and as I continued on, it was also helping the talent because – the color analyst was wondering why it wasn't X. And if you could add that one or two nuggets to a play every once in a while, very infrequently, it made sense to them. They could draw their circles as we were getting ready for the next play. And that's when it started. I started to understand at that point, you're not just working a game now. Now you're part of a production of, uh, of an entertainment space and uh, you're not beholding to it, but you can be an asset to it while you continue to do what you're doing. So that grew. And without my brother's help and that from a distance, understanding what was necessary to take you to another level, uh, he did that, you know? So it, it, it has so many, so many directions. We could be on for hours really talking about all of them, but, but he was an amazing and still is to this day, thank God, uh, an amazing big brother and an amazing mentor as I go through every chapter of my life, you know, so I'm very, very thankful for that. Incredible. Just a couple more promise and let you go get some rest. <laughs> will you, for those of us who have, will never be there and maybe <clears throat> the closest we get is an end zone seat or, or somewhere lower level behind the sidelines, but can you take us Gene to the field and the best, biggest, most intense, fiercest competitive athletes in the world. Some would say well, the proverbial won the genetic lottery, but you were in the midst of it and you've got this incredible intensity surrounding you. Can you in those moments, because you're having to execute, you're having to keep that mind constantly clicking uh, and so much detail, can you appreciate the intensity and the artistry and the skill that's happening around you? Can, is, is it possible to do both at the same time? Y yes. Um, I think some of the artistry part of it, right? Uh, you don't really get to embrace at times what an amazing catch it was uh, because you're working parts of the play as it unfolds right or or that type of element when you get back and you realize and you come home and watch the game and realize that that was you in that moment it's it's beyond explanation because then you're really humbled and it kind of much more nervous when you watch it than when you participated in it um the rest of it though uh yes you 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 definitely are in the moment um 
look to play at a level like that to play at any level but naturally as we go up as you said the the lottery picks right um what you what you what you what you have to do and what you also um have to master uh is is those facets of concentration emotion intensity awareness in the moment awareness uh the humility and understanding that every 5 second play in its own universe could define you for the rest of your life mm. which creates an amount of pressure that you cannot replicate again once you quit playing or once you quit participating and officials are participating in those in football those 6 second universes 150 times every sunday in the nfl as the players are so where you have to take yourself as a person and the level that you have to maintain at that or keep that level maintained for a three-hour window without a break literal break because if you break down for four seconds if you blink your eyes too many times you're going to miss the pass fumble you either get smothered by that because it will create a panic attack or you enhance your level of awareness to a space where this calmness comes about you and everything slows down. You know, great players will always say, or you'll hear coaches say, yep, after that second or third year, the game slowed down a little bit, right? And we kind of take that hand in hand with that. That's a literal statement. That is not a cliche. Um, and it is because when we, when you focus on anything, I believe in life to a, such a high level, especially under that pressure, you must take yourself to a place that becomes a very calm space. Um, but your level of awareness is so, so high that you feel that moment. That, quite frankly, is what I became rather addicted to as an official. And I think it's what did propel me to want to do 80 basketball games, a full NFL schedule. And then to start challenging myself, like, can you pull it off six days out of seven or 15 straight weeks on that stage, five nights out of seven, four nights out of seven, six nights out of seven, and continue to get there? Can you continue to do it and do it? Um, so I would tell you that, yeah, as the players, the great ones perform in that space like that, it's the identical thing for the officials. And I think a lot of it, and Aaron Rodgers and, uh, said it many times, and, and we've talked through that process a little, it, it was awareness, I think. And that's probably the best word because it kind of encapsulates a lot of different things, right? It's the awareness of the intensity, the emotion, uh, of understanding the nuance of the game. When, when is a foul really become a foul? How do we mold this? How do we keep it consistent? Uh, how do we deal with all of those things? And then all of a sudden, how do we live at that level of concentration um, and, 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 and never and, and not falter and, and not have a breakdown, not for five seconds, you know, and then understanding we're going to get 97 percent of these right. And if that three percent we miss because we're just human is at the wrong time and it's the wrong six second play. It's what defines you potentially for this holy 30 year endeavor. So it's that amount of pressure, which you can't control, again, that either smothers you or it's kind of what drives you. So what to some people would be smothering is to other people, what what is the reason why they continue to do it? Which is another conversation I think I have with my psychologist on the fact that they all hate you as well, right? So <laughs> it is that, quite honestly, that is that. Um, um, and I and I think that I think that uh, that's what it is, uh, and that's what other with people that I think say you know you're just reffing. I mean anybody can ref. It's just you're just going out with a whistle in your mouth or something like that. Quite honestly the most athletic things I did in my whole life. And I played three sports and went to college and played football for a few years. The most athletic things I ever did in my life were officiating. You know, you were juggling your personal life, your family, your job, uh, father time, your body declining. You have to eat right. You have to sleep as much as you can. You have to navigate all these other things. And then by the way, at seven o'clock, there's a game. You can't miss anything for these next two hours either. And then you got to get right back and get to bed because you got to get right and get ready tomorrow. 
That's what athletes do. It's the same schedule. It's the identical schedule. The only luxury that young athletes have that we didn't as officials is no athletes are playing into their mid and late 50s, right? So eventually father time does win. And to keep your body physically there, to quite honestly keep your mental capacities to that level of, 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 of elevation, at some point the, the clock starts to challenge you even more on how much work you have to do to just stay even, right? And not get higher in certain parts of it. So as you decline a little, maybe on the physical space, the wisdom of the games helps. You manage the games better because of the experience. It was that whole blending that, uh, that just really makes officiating a really cool thing to do. Phil, we have to get Gene, when, when, when the tournament is over, if he has vacations, family stuff, we cancel it all and we get Gene out on tour. I mean, we get him every night in front of a thousand people or, or 10 people somewhere. This is insane. I mean, what? It's it, insane. Ahead, and no, it's insane. We, we get him out on tour and we will not charge anything, Gene. We won't take any percentage. We're not doing we, it for, we're doing it for nothing, Phil. We're, we're doing it for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you have to talk to my wife about that. I don't know. She doesn't let me out of the house for nothing too often. All right, maybe maybe a couple Phil, dollars. A couple you dollars. Go. There you go. <laughs> hey, Phil. Before we let Gene go, anything? I do have one thing, Gene. That picture behind you, you yes. and Ray Lewis. Yeah. One of our favorite football players of all time. And John had mentioned intensity, and you just spoke to intensity. I, I don't have a question about it. I, I've just been looking at that picture and thinking, yeah. man, that's awesome. What yeah. the football the football next to it? What what, what is that? Uh, I think this one that was the first game I officiated. You get a commemorative ball with the signatures of all the crew on it. You know, very fortunate to have a lot of relics around. We're moving out of this home, my wife and I, now that the kids are all grown and and building our kind of retreat home for the adult family and good Lord willing, as many grandkids as they, uh, as they bless us with. Yes. Uh, but this was a made up basement turned into a workout space. And, and when I have done some of these with Ray on some podcasting or, or NFL Showtime, NFL, the, the Showtime show, we would do this kind of from a distance and he would see the same thing that, is down here for the reasons you just mentioned, Phil, because at 6.30 as I've aged and want to get down to the treadmill and the workout, that I anytime I had Baltimore, when I would hit the field, I would try to find where he was because oh. to, to see him, to see his level of intensity 30 minutes before kickoff, it gave me another piece had put in it got me you know what i mean so wow. that's what that picture is that's just a meet and greet before another Steeler raven game or whichever game that one was it didn't matter ray's intensity quite frankly is like that probably as we speak now or where it was on sunday but i've always told him i said <clears throat> you're who i need to see every morning when i don't really feel like getting on the treadmill oh, that's right? awesome uh, wow so great that, ask that, phil Great, great answer, <laughs> Gene. Did there. he? Yeah. What'd you say, Gene? I said, that's why this one's here. Because when I turn the corner, the first thing I see is 52 on that jersey. And I re reflect back to what I know I looked at 30 minutes before kick. And it kind of gets me ready to go in the morning on the treadmill, you know. For that's awesome. Minutes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. What What would Ray say? What has he said to you, Gene, if it's anything you can share? What would he, I mean, the guy knows that business, like few. Yeah. How, how would he sum up your thing? Did he Did he really he appreciate what, he what you did? Yeah. You know, John, I don't know if it was anything specific in the wording of it, um, but it's intent, it was intensity, right? It was focus. Um, it, it was just his awareness level on the field was you know, was very hard to duplicate or to even explain. And when you couple that level of awareness with the intensity that he brought it with, 
and then the physicality of the way he played. He would get frustrated at times, especially as the rules started to change. Mm. And uh, the intimidation factor is never a dirty player. He was not a dirty player in any sense of the word, respected the game tremendously, but also understood. And I believe not to speak for him, but humbly to try to encapsulate what I think some of the essence of him was, was he understood to impose your will on your opponent respectfully, but in a fearful way was part of the process. It was a necessity in his world to do that. And when you're down there officiating that and making sure they stay within the you know parameters, to watch them do that um, was an amazing thing to see. And he got that. So it was more of it was more of an energy, I would have to say, around him than it was any specific wording. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because you can feel that again, when I, you know, awareness goes many different angles. Uh, you, you feel that it's tangible when, when an alpha like that reflects the grouping of, of a many other lottery picks and then they elevate collectively, you know, great, great way to put it. I had, I had a, a nine year NFL player spend some years with the Titans <clears throat> who said to me, that before a playoff game, the air the air was thick with you know anticipation. Anyway, he said, and then Ray came out, Gene, and Ray did his around the stadium rally and get people up. And you know how this tough NFL player described that? He said it was frightening. I mean, that's yeah. amazing stuff. That's that's Ray, man. We are big fans of Ray. Gene, we're, we're such fans of you and are so thankful for the time you've given us today, the things you've had to say. We, we've all learned so much from you and certainly a person who is living and, and has done it for so many years the right way. We so appreciate you. Um, lastly, what does this week look like for you travel-wise with business, with the tournament? Studio again, mm -hmm. uh, a little less inventory, but uh, a greater stake, right? Uh, it's Sweet 16, greater Elite stage. 8 week now. Um, we're into the quarter, we're into the, you know, that round, and then the round that takes you to the semis and to the big trip to Arizona this year. Um, so... Uh, as you continue through the tournament, the stakes continue to grow. Uh, the excitement continues to build. And uh, and we're back into the studio, not with 12 screens moving at the same time. A little less volume on the amount of screens, but no less uh, importance on whatever is occurring. You know, quite honestly, the less of Gene, the better the game <laughs> probably went. Um uh, but I'm sure there'll be some moments there where hopefully if, if they do decide to throw to me and it's something that can be explained rather quickly to make this small percentage of what the officials want to be as it relates to the game too or the recognition of it, I feel the same thing in my space, right? I'm not the, we don't need 80% of Gene today for the two hours of the game, but you know what? If we need 2% of him to clear this up or just to, just give me a little look inside of what these guys and gals are going to be facing or or how that happened or how well they did on such a hard play that we get the luxury to watch in slow motion. Then I think it enhances the experience and lifts the game. And that's what we hope for. And really, honestly, from the CBS side, uh, maybe the, the greatest sporting event in its totality, right? Because it's mm, a month best. of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can tell you, you know, I got to work. 10 or 11 of them. Uh, but to be involved with it, with this network and this talent and to be involved with every game, not just the one, two or three you might ref and to watch them navigate this and take this nightly occurrence of just another memory. And then quite honestly, at the end, to encapsulate it all with that beautiful song and that ball goes up and oh. we have that one shining moment. And you just sit there for three minutes and watch what these producers and directors put together and and create that memory for yeah. not just the sport, but for part of our lives. And that's what they do at CBS. You know what I mean? That they, they do that. 
and uh, and this is this is an amazing part of the journey, which I would have been never expected when I started working fifth grade basketball in a parochial gym. Uh, but to be in this place, surrounded by these amazing people, and watch how they bring all of these amazing athletes and experiences to your living room and do it so effortlessly and then create these moments. Um, it's a pinch me life, you know what I mean? So uh, you just continue to stay grateful and, and, you know, and so happy to kind of be part of that process. And, and uh, as I said, only that much a gene this week, but, uh, but I get to be around them all a hundred percent of the time, which is, uh, you know, really a great blessing. Uh, incredible and, and certainly no mystery why CBS has for decades been the kings and queens when it comes to uh, big time sports and getting it done. As you said, that production crew, the talent, the way that it, talk about let's bring it way back to the <clears throat> beginning of the conversation. Talk about a well oiled machine. And they certainly are in Gene. Love what you do. So much respect for you. God bless you. Thank you. Phil. Gene, Gene. thank you so much for your time. You're, uh, th uh, it's just been fantastic. Thank you. So, so honored. I've enjoyed it. I hope we can do it again sometime. Amen. Gene. How's next week look? <laughs> it might be a little fool here for the next few weekends, Phil, but... But then we'll be off and running and get up into the mountains and we can talk all you want. Free we'll tickets. go see a Pirates game. <laughs> there, there, there you, you go. go. Hey, Gene, safe travels to you uh, for uh, this week and best to you and your family. Thanks, you guys too. Thanks Appreciate so much. Care. Bye, Gene. Wow, Phil. Wow. Un un unbelievable. Just so many nuggets. The stories, the wisdom. What? sticks with you. I mean, there's so much. Yeah, there's, there's so much, um, <clears throat> so much. What, one of the great things that he mentioned was being able to take long rides in cars, right. Mm. With, with the, the old school, the veteran officials. And as he mentioned, you know, somebody asking what, you know, what, what coach Knight talk to you about? What, what did he talk to you about? Those stories of the veteran officials helping the upcomers, helping the younger ones, uh, just priceless to me. It was fantastic. Amen, Phil. Absolutely agree. It was a chill giver on multiple fronts, multiple examples in the stories. Like you said, the, the camaraderie he described, the life bonding with his fellow officials, like you said, the youngsters coming up, the oldsters like him that called the game at seven, tipped it off at seven, in the car at 9.30 or 10 for a four or five hour drive yeah. from a, a Lawrence, Kansas, a, a Bloomington, Indiana, these hallowed halls, these Hall of Fame coaches, Roy, Bob Knight, on and on with Gene and those rides in the car he described, it's 10 degrees outside. It's the black of dark night, a uh, sack of burgers, right, Phil? Sack of yeah. burgers, maybe some fries or onion rings spilling on the seat at some point. <laughs> and uh, yeah. life stories and bonding happening um, in that situation. Amazing stuff. So, so much there. And so appreciative again to Mr. Gene Steratore for giving us his time, being so gracious, so gracious uh, during a hectic schedule for him. Just, just nuts. Yeah. Thank you again for joining us for episode two of Says Who Sports. It's all about you. Always, we will bring value, do our best to bring you value that we promise. See you soon, right, Phil? And in the meantime, talk a better game.